Hello, and welcome to the World Wanderers Podcast, a proud part of the Wander Barn Podcast Network. I'm Ryan. I'm Amanda. And we're your hosts. We're a traveling couple and digital nomads taking you on our adventures as we explore locations, destinations, and careers. Enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the World Wanderers Podcast. We are very excited and grateful that you're joining us for today's episode of the show. And today, we're really excited to be joined by Brandon Miller. Brandon provides a unique insight, which will have you convinced that a second passport is not just a nice to have, but a life transforming investment. And we're really excited to dive into this. This is something as you know, Canadians, we hadn't really thought about it until the last couple of years. And, and especially, you know, now having a daughter who has two passports, she was born in Mexico and is also Canadian by by heritage and by by her parents. So it's kind of cool to see, you know, such a little person have two passports and we're like, hmm, how do we get ourselves a second passport? And this is something where there's lots of opportunities with that. So we're excited to dive in with Brandon to talk all about that. We're also excited to talk about his travel experiences, living abroad, and everything that's led him to creating his business. So let's get into it. Brandon, welcome to the show today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're excited to chat with you. Can you start by sharing where you're joining us in the world? I am in Toronto, uh, Toronto, Canada. And uh, yeah, I'm just... this This is where I call home now. Amazing. And where are you from originally? Uh, I'm originally from the Toronto area, the, the greater Toronto area. Um, I, you know, I went off to uh, went off to school in Ottawa, so I hung out there for a bit. And then I like to think that uh, after that, I, I went out and explored. Nice. So. Awesome. Well, maybe we can start there. Can you tell us a little bit about your background with travel? What first got you interested in travel and all that good stuff? Yeah, so um, I actually, uh, like a lot of young people, in, in uh, they finish off school I uh, don't know what they're doing. And I just randomly saw a sign to go teach English in Korea. So I did that whole route. Um, so I went over to Korea. I was going to go for a year, come back, finish off law school and, um, you know, do a master's in something like a lot of other people at that crux are. And I decided to actually stay because I was like, this is awesome. And uh, I ended up turning, taking one year and turning it into effectively 15 uh, I lived mostly predominantly in Asia. I spent eight years in the Philippines, four in Korea. I lived in the Middle East for a little bit and uh, traveled and seen the world quite extensively. Um, so yeah, that was that was kind of what kicked it all off. And were you teaching English in all those places in the Philippines and the Middle East? No. So what happened was is um, I taught English for four and a half years, and I I like to think that I climbed the top of the. Uh, English teaching ladder in Korea. I, I had the best job ever, which was uh, I worked at a university, had like five months vacation, and and you know um, I was only working four days a week, nine hours, nine hours a week, so perpetual like extended weekends. But honestly, I was just bored, um, and I, I went out and I started a business. Uh, business did very well uh, at my young age, and I expanded that. And when I went to the Philippines, the Philippines was more of a lifestyle choice for me. I had my own business at that point. I was traveling back and forth between Canada and Asia, but uh, I, you know, I I was doing a lot of scuba diving back then, and fell in love with the the concept of like, yes, I can work during the week and scuba dive on the weekends. Um, so yeah, I just, uh, I just love the place and, and it was a nice central place for me to be in, uh, in Asia plus, you know, it's the tropics. So yeah, it was great. It was great. Yeah. That sounds awesome. Just as you were talking, I was like, hmm, do I want to be an English teacher in Korea? That sounds pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it really was. And, it, and I got to tell you more so than the job, it, it opened up my eyes to, you know, the world and, and, you know, I, I think a lot of times when you're exploring the world, there's so many great things uh, that you get to understand. And I, I, you know, I was addicted. I was addicted to the travel. Like I'm literally going to places and I'm just like, wow, this is so interesting. And you can't get that concept without actually doing it. Uh, so for me, that was that was the addiction for me. I was like, wow, this place is really this is cool. I'm learning so much. Um, and then, yeah, you're getting paid for it. It's great. So. Yeah, for sure. I was going to say our story is a little bit similar to yours. It's same, same, but different. We, yeah. after university, also went went traveling, except we were doing the backpacking thing and we were only gone for six months. But I feel like it was like so eye-opening to go to these places around the world and 
hear different languages and see these things that we'd seen on TV and movies in with our own eyes. And then coming back to Canada and getting a full-time job was a little bit like womp womp. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, I think that there's a lot to say to it. And one of the one of the big takeaways about the world that I've learned is that no matter where you go, like, you know, take the religion, politics and all that stuff aside, people are people. And people just want to like, you know, live their life, have a nice, secure place for their family, make a decent wage and just be left alone by and large. Right. So uh, that was it was really great. And and I've just had so many welcoming experiences where people have welcomed me into their home, show me around their place. And now I've kind of parlayed that into me doing that for people coming here. So uh, which is awesome. It's a great extension of it. Yeah, for sure. And so were you continuing to work when you lived in, you know, places like the Philippines? Like you said that you were there for eight years. Were you working in the Philippines, starting some online work? What were you doing at that point? So when I was in the Philippines, um, I I basically had a business that I imported there and I didn't really actually enter the labor market uh, uh, per se. Um, I did venture into some things. We were offshoring different curriculums. I got into some software development and and things along those lines. Uh, probably looking back on it, I got into some things that I shouldn't have. Uh, but that's another story. Um, but I, um, you know, it was, uh, yeah, I was just living. I was working. I was, um, you know, I, I've always kind of made my own way. I've worked for myself since I've been like, you know, 24, 25, 25. Yeah, 25. Um, so yeah, it was just, I was just doing that, living life, having a great, great old time. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. And I'm curious, like, at what point the idea of second passports kind of became, you know, on your radar? Because I think, and maybe you can share your experience, but I feel like our experience as Canadians has been, you know, we are so lucky to have one of, you know, the best passports in the world. And so you often don't think as a Canadian, like, hey, I could use another passport, or maybe I should invest in getting another passport and, and that type of thing. So I'm curious, like, how this kind of became on your radar and something that you were interested in. That is, uh, and no, I'm not saying this because it's like, oh, that's a great question. A lot of people always say that, but that actually, you just hit the nail in that question on the head. And I'd like to answer that in two ways. Uh, the first one is basically how I found myself to uh, to do this type of work. And the second one is, is what you uh, very astutely touched on is, is the thinking behind a second passport. Um, so, um, the first thing is, is I, I found this and I found my way to this industry. I had a background in law and I was doing educational consulting and I was working with a company that asked us to bring in a curriculum and, and help them do that. Now they had a, uh, immigration component to them. Looking back on it, they, they, you know, they weren't doing things properly, but I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And I was, you know, curious by nature. I looked at it and I said, this is awesome. Like this actually allows me to, um, you know, use my legal experience, use my experience from around the world and help people kind of find a nice second secure home in Canada. I've been working in this industry for about 12 years and I have a very eclectic client base. Uh, I'm not just working predominantly in one area or one culture. I'm working with people from all over the world, which, you know, sometimes you'll get people like, you know, the Indian consultant works with like Indians, right? Or the Chinese consultant works with Chinese people. I, I've been lucky because I work with all of those uh, people, but I also work from with people from different areas. And I struggled with the, I struggled with the question for many times is like, how do I communicate with people? Because it's different People want different things, but I've actually over the last year, two years, I've come to to realize it's actually it's the same for everybody. And what people are looking for predominantly are basically options for the future. Now, taking that to the second part of your question about uh, you know why is this important for say somebody from the U.S. or the U.K. or or Canada, I'll share a story that I had with a lady in the U.S. And I'm not going to tell you where she worked or anything because you can readily identify her. <laughs> and so there's certain confidentiality that I have to follow. But she works for a very large tech company. She has uh, probably, you know, world-class education from all the, the name brand schools that you would think. And she's in a very, very senior role. And I said to her, I said, why do you want to move? You know, like, you know, we went through all the stuff and I said, what, what's the reason that you want to move? And she said, you know what? I'm a first generation 
uh, immigrant here to the United States. My parents came here because they they saw opportunity for me. I now have a two year old, and I don't really see the same opportunities for my two year old that my parents saw for me when I came here. She's like opportunities shift around the world, and we don't know what the world's going to look like in you know fifty years, seventy five years, et cetera, et cetera. So I I'm looking to basically have some options open for my child. Now, on top of that, I I think that you know, pre-COVID, a lot of people in the Western world didn't really understand this. And I know, uh, you know, as a Canadian passport holder or an American passport holder or somebody from a European nation, that you have the ability to travel pretty freely. Uh, you can move. But if you're from the Philippines or you're from India or you're from somewhere else, um, you know, you have to like basically front up to a visa application and and prove that you're not a criminal and all of these different things. And you're like, man, I just want to go to Niagara Falls and, you know, have a vacation like a normal person. For the first time in COVID, I think the Western nations kind of tasted this. You know, we had lockdowns, we had people couldn't travel, uh, there was restrictions on this. And it was like, what's happening? You know, like there's there's different, you know, um, it's a word I'm looking for. They they got a they got a feeling of what most of the world feels in terms of freedom of movement and things like this. So I don't believe as much as giving up your passport because like you don't want to pay taxes or things like that. And again, I don't judge if people want to do that. I have some clients that are looking at that. But I think that you know, uh, looking ahead to the future and looking as how the world is going, having options for the future is important. And I think that um, you know. I've got some clients specifically from the United States. Uh, a lot of times I hear this. I got one guy, for instance, outside of Chicago. He's like, yeah, I'm not really interested to come to Canada as much because I'm like, I'm doing awesome. But I am interested to make the sacrifice to come up there and live uh, for for my kids so that they have options uh, for, their, uh, for the future. And they can also pass those on generationally for, for, their, uh, for their grandchildren. So that's a bit of a long answer. Uh, I apologize, but hopefully that kind of answers the question and, and provides some insight. Yeah, no, please don't apologize. That was a great answer. And I'm glad that you kind of just walked us through all of that. And I think just for us, I think we were kind of interested in the idea of like basically since we started traveling or maybe kind of 2014-ish, like, oh, it'd be really interesting to like have a child in another country and be able to get them another citizenship based on that. And then we were in Panama, like pre-pandemic, kind of sussing out the residency program. And we were like, hmm, would this be... We were kind of like, okay, we want to start a family in the next couple of years. Like, would this be a good option? Pandemic hit, we ended up going back to Canada. And then Panama was not an option to return to because they were very, very strict with the restrictions. So we ended up coming to Mexico where we'd previously lived and getting residency here, ended up having our baby here, that type of thing. But I think that for us, like I think we had thought, oh, it'd be, you know, cool for our child. It'd be cool for our children to have this opportunity. I think for us, we were kind of like, oh, well, you know, we've got a great passport. Maybe we don't necessarily need to look into this for ourselves. But just like you said, I think with the pandemic, it was kind of like, whoa, like some crazy things have happened in countries that, you know, like Canada, UK, Australia. US to some extent where it's like we didn't really expect this to ever happen in our lifetime and kind of makes you consider like hey having other options is is probably a smart thing to do. I I totally agree and and the other thing is to like I I take this back and I'll go back to you know if you've ever done this in school but Maslow's hierarchy of needs right the security portion of it uh is a huge one and I see this all the time you know when strife happens in you know, things happened in Hong Kong or or things happened in Ukraine back in two. Like, I always see a bump in applications. And you always hear on the news about, you know, oh, I don't like the election. I'm moving to Canada. Right. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. all of these all of these different things happen. Now, I'll tell you, uh, speaking on that, generally what we've seen is, is that 2016 happened. You know, it crashed the servers and all the other stuff. And Google puts out the ads and, you know. Uh, generally, we had a bunch of inquiries and people, as soon as they found out, they were like, I got to take an English test. What are you talking about? I, don't, I already said I'm not taking English. And they lose interest really quickly. There's still a good section of people that are like that. However, 
This happened again with with it generally gravitates around election times and, and not to politicize anything. But this is when we see a real bump in it. Um, you know, around 2020, people were like, OK, we're out. We want to we want to move. And they were actually I had uh, I had a lot more people that were really taking the step seriously and actually doing it uh, more so than that. And I think. I think coming up, we'll probably see a very similar trend. Uh, it's sustained its, itself somewhat more, I find. Um, but again, you look at like the UK, for instance, the UK has been having people retire, taking massive equity out of their homes and retiring to like Spain or Australia or Portugal or places like this. But, you know, there's, there is a mass exodus out of, out of that. And I think the Western world is changing. On top of that, Migration is really uh, a question I really get is why are we bringing people to Canada, you know, and the biggest thing is, is that what the world's going to see in the next that we're seeing and we're going to see in the next 20 or 30 years more so is a real shortage of human capital, which everyone likes to talk about the economy, Ah, the economy, the economy. Well, you know, for an economy to run outside of like, you know, AI and robots and all the different things of where we're going, put all that aside. You need people and you need taxes and you need different different things to make these things work in the conventional way of thinking. Um, there is a shortage in the Western world of, of talent, uh, and that is becoming more pronounced from a Canadian perspective. You know, back in the 1970s, just to contextualize this, we had uh, six retiree or six workers to every one retiree. Currently, we have uh, we have. Uh, three workers to every one retiree. And in 2030, 2035, we're going to be down to two. Uh, it doesn't sustain all of the great things that we have here in Canada, like free health care, education, government benefits, all the other different things that we have. Plus, we have all those great retirement benefits. And I'm air quoting for everybody um, where, you know, you can, you know, you're paying into the system and it has to sustain itself. So these are um, these are real issues that not only Canada is facing, but the Western world is facing. So I think you're going to see a little bit, well, you're already seeing it, different migratory patterns, but there's also the benefits to that, which are the passports and the different things that uh, that go along with it, which is, you know, labor mobility, for instance, right? A lot of people uh, don't understand. We always hear about trade agreements and different things like this, or, you know, farmers in Wisconsin are getting screwed over by Canadian dairy farmers or something like that. That's the stuff that hits the news. But when you have businesses moving and you have those trade agreements in place, there's always worker provisions. And a lot of people are very naive to this, how the passport that you have, you can use that to leverage to basically work around the world. Canada, for instance, has mobility to Europe. We have mobility through the TPP. We have NAFTA, now we call Kuzma. We have stuff with Chile. We have stuff with uh, Colombia, uh, different trade agreements in there, which, which people can people can leverage if they know how to do it. Awesome. Thanks for thanks for sharing all of that. And yeah, I think it's been really interesting for us just in regards to what you were saying about migratory patterns, just, you know, being down in Mexico and seeing how many people are coming to Mexico from I mean really all over the world, but there's a ton of Canadians, a ton of Americans who are coming getting residency here. You know, we're in expat community, Facebook communities like across for a, a lot of the major cities here, cities that we've lived in. And now we're pretty settled in one city kind of north of Mexico City. And there's a huge expat community here. Lots of people who, you know, have jobs in the city, that type of thing. So they're living here because of that. But a lot of other people who are similar to us who are, you know, traveling the world working remotely pre-pandemic. Obviously, we couldn't travel to a lot of places for a number of years. And you know, there's still a lot of places that are still really shut down or it's really strict or things are kind of open, close, open, close. And Mexico has been like a really great place to just be throughout this. And it's been interesting seeing just how many people are kind of kind of coming here. And of course, there's still tons of people from all over the world, like migrating to places like Canada and the US. But just interesting to see lots of like Canadians and Americans specifically coming to Mexico. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But they also, if you think about it, they have the freedom to do that, right? And I think that that's, uh, you know, that actually is is the benefit of the passport. It gives it gives people options. And again, I don't know what the uh, entry requirements are for Mexico, for instance, but uh, I, you know, I have a lot of 
clients that'll have foreign workers that are working with them that'll want to travel with those workers that are on different passports. And it can be a little bit more challenging uh, because they have to go through a process. So I think that's the big thing that we don't really think about. And I think that those things are shifting for a lot of people. I, I think it's really in the face for, you know, somebody from China or India, for instance, right? Uh, as an example, I'd like to use those as examples. But, you know, you take China, a lot of people, you know, having a passport is just kind of like, yeah, we got a passport. But it's their mentality is, is like, I need to have my nest egg somewhere else so that it's secure kind of deal. Somebody from India is looking at, you know, geez, man, I have skills and I want to use my skills and I want to be like compensated properly. And I want to be able to travel and not feel like, you know, a criminal, you know, when I have to do, you know, I have to put all these visa applications together and, and whatnot. So I think that, um, you know, from a from a Western standpoint, I think it's more future thinking and I got to tell you, I have people that will contact, you know, the first time I heard this was about seven or eight years ago. I had a lady, she was from China and she was deciding between Australia and um, Canada. And she said, you know, she's like, listen, I want to retain your services. I, I want to come to Canada. And I said to her, I said, why, why do you, why do you want to come to Canada? Because I ask, I ask everybody that because I'm curious. She says, you know, I think that Canada is good in about 75 years is going to have more water than uh, Australia. And I think that uh, resources are going to become very important around that time. And I want to be in a resource rich place. I was like, whoa, that's pretty, uh, <laughs> that's pretty out there and forward thinking. And, and that type of thinking impresses me because most people don't think this far in advance. Most people think maybe three to five years, but they're not thinking 25, 50, 75 years in advance. And I would challenge anybody who's listening to this to do that. Start thinking about where you think the world's going to be and what things are going to look like. And I can tell you, here's your indication. A lot of people will say, yeah, you know, this isn't the place that I grew up in. You'll hear that a lot, right? But those are indicators. So if that's not, if that's 20 years or 30 years, right? I don't know how old your average listener is, but, you know, things are different and things are evolving and changing and you have to plan for the future, not only for yourself, but your family. Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting going back to that point about um, just taking travel for granted. I think, you know, so many of us from Canada the States do that. We have a friend who's from India originally, has like a very good professional job. He's working for Spotify for a while. I was doing the the nomad thing and just seeing him go through, like, obviously he can come to Mexico, no problem, but he was trying to go to certain places in South America and applied for a visa to Argentina and they rejected him. And he's like, you know, yeah, very wealthy professional. He's just looking to go travel. That like, has absolutely no interest in living in Argentina, and they won't even let him like go travel there because of their, you know, their weird bureaucracy about it. And it's, you know, some uh, stories like that with the Philippines. We met a girl from yep. Palestine who had to apply for visas like everywhere. Um, yep, and just yeah, hard to imagine kind of being in that situation because we take travel for granted. No, I look at that. I remember more predominantly in the Middle East. Um, when I lived there, I was certainly, because of my passport, I was treated a lot differently than migrant workers that are coming in from, say, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, places like that, Philippines. And I, I'll tell you, uh, it it really, I, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying I, I'm happy that I have that, but it's not fair. Like, it is not fair. Um, and I, I don't think it's fair for people. I, I think one of the things that's not really talked about as much is, you know, this freedom of mobility. I you know, my wife is from the Philippines. Um, she's a Canadian citizen now, but uh, I, you know, I had to go through that process. Um, now, mind you, she was she was lucky because she was approved for her stuff. But it was like, you know, I remember going to Korea. I had business up there, and I was like, yeah, let's go up and do this. Like the grueling process that was put through. I'm like, listen, you, you jackasses. Like we're just coming in. We're hanging out for a weekend. We're gonna go down and and see some people, and that's it. Like. They raked her over the coals just because of her nationality. And I, I I think it's something that a lot of people don't understand. You guys have obviously seen it up close, but think how your Indian friend feels. He's like, you know, what's this, man? Like, I just want to come in and vacation. I don't, you know, I'm not setting up shop and running, running for the hills. And I, I also think that it's something uh, that's a problem uh, in terms of uh, the way that decisions are made in some of these some of these countries, because I can tell you, um, you know, I see it and uh, it's just not fair. 
Oh, fair. Yeah. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. We have a, a friend who's Filipino and I mean, her and her partner have a really successful business. They've got a couple aspects to it. Like they do really well and she speaks perfect English. She's again, similar to our friend from India. Like she's not looking to work in these countries and, you know, quote unquote, take jobs from local people. And she was just back in the Philippines for a little while. And she wrote like, Oh, I just spent $2,000 on visas to be able to travel for like the next couple of months. And I'm just like, man, that's like, yeah. Like, passport equity is just, it's a thing that I think so many of us don't think about, but it really isn't fair because it's just where you're born, right? And then you're given this passport and you have to follow the rules of these other governments. And we had another friend who um, was trying to travel. He's Mexican. He was trying to travel with his Australian partner and he got denied for, I think, both his Canadian and uh, US visa, even though he's got a good job speaks good English, he's educated, you know, there's no reason why he shouldn't be approved. I think thankfully Canada's made it a little bit easier for Mexicans now, but yep. you know, if you're Mexican trying to go to the US, I mean, it's an absolute nightmare trying to get that that visa. Yeah, because everyone's painted as somebody who's going to come and overstay and take jobs, right? Work under the table, which is the furthest thing from the truth, right? You know, sure, sure. There's a, a certain section of people that will do that, but it's not. It's everybody's painted with this broad brush, and it, it it just, I you know, yeah. So I don't know. It's it's options for people, and I I think that that's what's important. Um, and I know the power of that. I know the power of that passport. Uh, and I, I think that a lot of people giving giving people the opportunity to hold that. Now I'm very careful to say because you know home is always home. Right. No matter no matter where you come from. Um, that's why I always say, like, it's a second home and it's an alternative home because you're never going to replace your home. Right. Even if somebody who's coming from a war torn country is a refugee, they don't want to be here. You know, everyone's like, oh, we're bringing in refugees or taking our jobs. I'm like, trust me, that guy from Syria, if there wasn't strife there, he doesn't want to be here. He wants to be back in his home because that's his home. And that's what he wants. He doesn't want to learn English. He wants to do what he wants to do. Right. Um, so again, I just think that there's there's a certain amount of uh, power to that, but there's also a lot of misconception. But I think it's now coming to the forefront of people to be able to see that and see some of the benefits. And we're not we're not immune to that in the Western world. At this at this juncture in time, like if you look 200 years ago, Europe was a place to be. Right. Then everyone came to the New World. Now, where is the next New World going to be in in the you know in the future? So you have to think about that and you have to keep your options open, not only for yourself uh, as much, but for your children and your grandchildren, I think. Yeah. And so for your business, is it entirely focused on helping people come to Canada or do you guys do other countries as well? No, we work. Uh, I'm, I'm licensed to, uh, to help people come to Canada. So that's my focus. Um, I, I think when you start looking around and weighing things out and no, I'm not you know, shamelessly promoting myself for Canada, uh, although I, I do like to do that. Um, I, I think that um, there's so many great things that are here and so many, like Canada, if you look at it, uh, and again, I this is like big air quotes because of the last couple of years, Canada actually has a pretty safe, secure alternative for people. Uh, we, we're doing things properly. I would like to think uh, in a number of different facets and there's good opportunity. And if you look at even with the pandemic, right, if you look at how many people when the pandemic hit retreated back to Canada, right, uh, I know what the numbers are because there was a lot of people that were living in the U.S., for instance, Canadian American citizens. When things started to go silly, there was a lot of people that were coming back to Canada and, and coming back here and settling and riding out the pandemic. So there's something to be said about some of the safety and security that that uh, was going on at different at different parts of the time. Um, but again, if you look at uh, some of the other things, like look at the lockdown, like look at what happened with India, right? They locked it out of everything, and South Africa and, and different things like that. You know, if you have the ability and the nationality and the different passport, you could have navigated those things quite a, a, quite a bit differently. So. I think that taking into those, and again, I don't want to focus on all of that as much because uh, I think it was just an isolated instance. But I also think it is, uh, it is a good, a good thing to think about for people. Uh, but yeah. again, 
again, the retirement benefits, the child care benefits, you know, environmental, like, you know, world's changing, super storms are happening. Like, where is the place that's going to be free from that? I don't know, maybe nowhere, but uh, again, having the options. Right? Yeah, for okay. sure. And so for anyone listening, who's kind of curious about like the process for doing this, like how do you actually go about starting the process for getting the second passport? So I have a website. Uh, it's mysecondpassport.ca. Um, that is, uh, that's something that's been a, I don't want to say a new initiative, but it's been something that I've wanted to do for years and years and years. It's based around the book uh, and a system that I've put together. Uh, and, and I like to say that I'm very unique in my industry because I take a very holistic approach to immigration. Um, and what I mean by that is, is that and you guys, you guys can certainly appreciate this because you've you've lived in different places, right? It's not only about getting to the place; it's about getting to the place and then figuring out what you're going to do and how to access all the opportunity when you're here. Now, if you speak to 99% of my colleagues, lawyers, consultants, whatever it is, you know they've been engaged to do a job, which is to get your immigration sorted out. But I actually see my role as somewhat different. I see my role as basically not only getting people here but a responsibility uh, to make sure that they get off on the right foot. They understand how to access some of the different opportunities that are available to them and, and go from there. So part of my system, which I call the immigration success system is, is that I have three phases. We put together a plan, we implement the plan, and then we help you get settled into Canada and, and actually access the opportunities. And I think that last part is one of the most important and often quite overlooked because some people are just like, well, I'll just get to Canada and everything will be like unicorns and rainbows. And I'm like, no, it won't. Um, because here's the thing. I was lucky while I was transitioning into immigration. I, I worked and helped people settle in uh, to Canada for two years. And I saw what the struggles are. And I've always kept that in mind because I, I don't want people to come here and, and do poorly. I want people to do well. So... Uh, part of what we do is we uh, help people not only get here, but we also plan with them uh, so that they can figure out how to, you know, do well here um, and and leverage the skills that they already have. Um, so, you know, we're really proud of that. And that's one of the things that uh, we enjoy doing. And I, we also think it's our duty to do that for people. Yeah. And do you guys see, is it, are most people coming from certain places? I imagine China would be a big one. India would be a big one. But do you guys see kind of patterns like that in terms of where people are that are interested in moving to Canada? So people are coming from all over the world. The biggest source countries are obviously China, India, the Philippines. Uh, they generally jockey for the top three spots. Um, there's a substantial amount of people that are coming in from the United States, for instance. Now, if you look at the numbers, they've jumped, I think, three or four times in the last like five years. Uh, and we're seeing people like students. Students are a big thing. Um, and, you know, uh, I'll give you an example, say, from the United States. We're dealing with a lot more students uh, that are coming in from there because, you know, education is so expensive. You can come to Canada, you know, go to, you know, world-class education here, and you can do it for a fraction of the cost. And, you know, you look at a parent, for instance, uh, they have to make a decision like, you know, do I sacrifice my retirement and put my kids in school? Uh, and and hopefully they can go and do their thing, or you know, what do I do, right? Do I do I quash my daughter's dreams? You know what I mean? So it, it's kind of like we're we're seeing a lot more people that are coming up to study, for instance, in that segment. But added on to that, uh, as an example, there's a way to actually take that, come and study, get an open work permit, be able to work here, and use that work experience to be able to uh, stay. Some people want to come in as uh, you know, tech workers, like there's so many different options there. There's something called the global talent stream, which I love. Uh, and it allows the tech industry to find uh, find needed workers. Uh, the service standard is two months for the approval for the employer to hire, or sorry, two months, two weeks for the employer to hire and two weeks for the work permit. So you can literally identify a worker and have them on the ground here in a month's time, um, which is in anything immigration is lightning fast. So we have all these really innovative programs uh, to bring people here. And what we do is, is we sit down, we have a planning process that we go through, 
And we look at somebody's situation and we tell them, we say, here's what your options are and here's how long it takes and here's what your proposed cost would be. And then we give them options. You can do it yourself. We'll give you some guidance. We have some great courses for that. Or we can just take it over and do it for you. Okay. And let's say, for example, I'm someone, I'm sitting in America. I have like a solid you know, professional background, degree, that type of stuff. And I'm like, oh, it'd be cool to move to Canada and work towards citizenship. What are kind of like, like if someone's really dedicated to doing it and had that wasn't like the right career, like what's that path look like in terms of time and like the steps to to get, you know, the move there and also to work towards a passport? Uh, so in terms of timing, um, that's a difficult question right now because COVID's actually throwing a real wrench in things. The service standard prior to coming here was about uh, was about eight to nine months uh, prior to COVID. Now we're probably up at about fifteen months if you're really super lucky under some programs, uh, and and it could go up to you know two years, two and a half years, something like that. Now there's there's also another answer to that is that people that's I'm talking permanent residency. So that would be akin to like the green card. Um, you know, if somebody wants to come in, especially an American and they're a professional under Kuzma or the old NAFTA, if you have the right profession and you have the right, uh, you have a job offer, right? You don't have to go through all this process. A company says, yeah, I want to hire you. Uh, you know, I'm going to fill out some documentation, put this together and I'm going to give you certain documents that person can fly into an airport in Toronto or they can drive up to the border and say, hi, I want to apply for a work permit. Here's my documentation. And thank you very much. There's your work permit on the spot. You can do that in a couple of weeks and be here on the ground. And if you're here as say on a work permit, you have pretty much all of the same rights as somebody who's a, a permanent resident or a citizen here, except you can't vote, join the military. And it's, it's temporary in nature. They can take it away. Whereas a citizen, that's a little bit more of a more difficult process, especially if you're born here. It's uh, that's not possible, uh, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, there's different options. It depends on on what that is, and and part of what we do is is we sit down with people and we find out what their goals are, what their timing is, and then we we put together a plan for them to do that. Awesome. Thanks for going through all of that. And um, yeah, crazy that the time has jumped up so much, although not surprising. We've had to do some things involving the Canadian government over the last couple of months and everything is taking forever uh, just because of COVID and the pandemic and stuff like that. So not surprised to hear that, although obviously a bummer. And so for that person who's like, you know, coming to Canada, you normally have to work for like a couple of years before you qualify for citizenship. Is that right? Like you can get the permanent residency and then... From there, it's a couple of years, and then you have to take the test and the English test. Is that right? Yeah. So what happens is for citizenship is uh, you have to be physically present in Canada for three years uh, as a permanent resident, and then you can apply. Uh, can apply. There's cavi- There's a caveat to that, however. If you're here as, say, a worker or a student, you can actually get credit for uh, up to a year credited uh, half days prior to becoming a permanent resident. So if you were here for two years, say as a worker or a student, for instance, or even a visitor, you're physically present, you can actually use that time and get credit half days up to two years, which would account for one year towards your physical presence of being in Canada for your citizenship. So it's possible to be here, say, as a student for two years and then stay another two years as a permanent resident and get your citizenship that way. Um, that's one of the options, uh, or you can just be three years after a permanent resident and, and then apply for citizenship. The benefit of citizenship is, is that once you, uh, once you have that passport, you know, there's no residency requirements as a permanent resident, you have to be here for two out of five years, uh, to maintain that and, and be living in Canada. Um, it's a little less onerous than say a green card holder, cause they have to make an uh, entrance every six months, or they they put that in jeopardy. There are certain ways of actually uh, working around that. But in Canada, for instance, you can come in, land, get your permanent residence, and then go away for two and a half years and still come back and still maintain it. But if you come here, you stay, 
and then you become a citizen after, say, three years, you get your passport, you can go disappear for 40 years um, and then come back and retire here if you'd like. Yeah. And then, Brendan, for anyone who's listening who maybe is Canadian and is like, hey, you know, getting a second passport would be something that would be cool. Obviously, Canada's not an option, although it'd be cool if you could just like, double up and get a double Canadian passport. <laughs> um, are there any countries where you kind of see as like, hey, if I was doing this myself, this is a place I would be interested in doing it? Um, maybe let's exclude the US because obviously that's like the super popular country. But yeah, any kind of places where you're like, oh, it's fairly streamlined process, seems like a very good place to be, um, that type of stuff? That's a good question. I, I think it, it really depends on a person's goals and what they're looking for. Um, a lot of things, you'd be surprised, and I was I know that from experience, you'd be surprised at how easy it is to actually go to a country and take up residence there. A lot of people, if they haven't done it before, they don't understand. Now, there's certain exceptions to that. Like uh, you look at a lot of countries in the Middle East, like unless you've got a sponsor, uh, you know, that ain't happening. But again, rolling into the Philippines or, or you know, even different places in Europe, like Spain, Portugal, uh, Cyprus, um, they all have different uh, passport programs where you can, just to name a few, there's, there's a bunch more. Uh, where you can basically come in, buy some real estate, and then go through the passport process uh, to be able to do that. Um, you know, down in the islands, Antigua, Barbuda, uh, St. Kitts, Nevis, uh, all of this, you can, you know, you can, for lack of a better term, buy a passport. Now, but you have to be aware of a few things. Uh, for instance, St. Kitts, uh, you know, this was something that turned into... Um, I don't want to say a business, but it was a business. They were there was a lot of passports that were coming out, and I think that you know there was an instance not to get in too far into it, but there was they were giving out you know somebody came out and bought a diplomatic passport, and then of, of and they were of questionable nature and fronted up in say Canada. So when countries actually uh, get a little it's the word freewheeling, I guess, with uh, handing out nationalities the nationalities might not be as good as when when you had them. So you have to be aware of those different things. Um, the Philippines, for instance, they have different retiree designations. Like you're not going to get a passport there, um, or you could, I guess, if, if you really wanted to do that. Uh, there's, I'm air quoting, different ways around that. Um, but you could, you could, um, you could do that. I, in terms of where you want to go, I don't know. Uh, that's a really good question. I think Canada's uh, certainly there if you're looking for something in the Western world. But I think that um, I, I do see a lot of the opportunity in my personal view shifting to some of the more of the developing world. Um, I, I think so. Yeah, I think I think the world's going to be well, not it's going to be a different place in 20, 30, 30 or so years. But then you have to take into account, say, global warming. Right. You know, I, I don't believe that we're going to get a handle on that the way that we should. I think that we're going to start losing land area. So maybe moving to an island nation might not be the best idea if you're looking at the developed world. I don't know. Um, I, I just think that uh, having those options are available. I know personally that I have uh, I have options, uh, you know, outside of Canada. Um, I probably, probably won't use them, um, but I do have options if I want to... Uh, if I want to do that, if I want to do something with that. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for, thanks for sharing all of that. Those are all really good suggestions. And I think just as, you know, two people who have gotten residency in another country, I think it's interesting to kind of look at, you know, places you're interested in places that you might want to live, maybe go spend some time there. Like, you know, for example, we were, I, I mentioned earlier, we were living in Panama, we have six months as Canadians. So it gives you a good opportunity to get a feel for things there. Panama is extremely hard to get a passport unless you're born there. But you know, you can get residency. They have a great residency program if that's something you're looking for. And then, you know, for us now, I'm not I don't have no idea if we'll ever get Mexican passports, but having the residency has been really great for us to be able to like legally live here longer than just being on a six month tourist visa. So I think just adding to what you said, I think, you know, finding countries you're interested in, go try them out, go, you know, look at what programs they have. I know we have 
a friend who just recently moved to Portugal. She bought a house there. Um, she got the permanent residency, and you know she'll qualify for a passport in a couple of years, which is which is pretty cool. And prior to that, she was a permanent resident in Japan. And Japan's another country that like you cannot get a passport in Japan no, unless you're born that's there. Locked, yeah. Unless you're Japanese, that's it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's even like we know somebody who is American and his daughter or son was born there and they don't even give it like on birth. It's like, yeah, like no. you're saying, you have to be Japanese to to get the Japanese yeah. passport. So and and if you're Japanese, because I have lots of Japanese clients who are permanent residents, but if they ever become a citizen, they give up their Japanese citizenship. Oh, interesting. I didn't I didn't know yeah. that. So yeah, and lots of things like, to consider with this. That's like for most people, for most Japanese people, that's like ripping off an appendage. So that's I've I've seen it once, uh, but I haven't. You know, people don't. My Japanese clients don't do that. I don't even yeah. have the citizenship uh, thing with them because it's too much of their identity. Yeah, for sure. That's a, what I mean, that's a broad, it's hard to get. It's hard brush. if you have to like give up your 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 passport and your citizenship to a country you're not only born in, but it's also like kind of a coveted one to have. <laughs> exactly. And I'll tell you what, I, I will never give up my Canadian citizenship. It's just not only from a nationalistic point of view, but currently, you know, just the opportunity that I have, because I've seen it in action. Um, and it's, you know, as I said, like it's provided me so many different opportunities. It's, it's unbelievable. It was also one of the calculations I had. There's one thing about not only having the passport, but where you're born. I've seen that with with other people who had American passports, but were born in the Philippines, but they were tarred as, as a Filipino and, and it limited some of their options for work in some of the different countries. Uh, I remember helping out a buddy of mine's daughter uh, who had like on paper was just amazing, but there was, there was some countries were not extending the opportunities to her because of where she grew up, which is crazy. So, yeah. but it happens and it's, it's, it's sad actually. Yeah, for so. sure. For sure. That's another example of this wacky world we live in. I but know. And I hate to be such a downer on it, but you know, but it's, it's just, uh, these are things that, these are real issues that people have to deal with. No, for sure. And it's important to keep it real and not just act like, you know, everything's yeah. rainbows, Unicorns and, and rainbows and butterflies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All these good things. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Brandon. This has been really insightful and super interesting. If people want to learn more about you, more about your business, maybe work with you, where can they find all of that information? So uh, they could go to the website, which is mysecondpassport.ca. Um, or uh, one of the things that I, uh, I like to tell people is, is if they want to send me an email and say that they heard about me on your show, uh, they can I can send them a copy of the book. Um, and it's a really great uh, opportunity to learn maybe a different perspective. Or you can go buy it on Amazon, but I'd rather send you, send you a copy uh, so you can read it. But there's one caveat to that. And like I said, when I uh, asked that uh, Chinese lady who was deciding between Australia and Canada, um, if you do, just let me know why why you're interested to come to Canada because I'm very curious. I, and and sometimes it's a lot of the standard answers, but uh, sometimes I just get answers. I'm like, wow, I never thought of it like that. So that would be the caveat. So Brandon at mysecondpassport.ca, that'll come directly to me and not some, you know, uh, virtual assistant in some far off land and uh, just, yeah, reach out and let me know. I'll, uh, I, and I'll point you in the right direction. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time today, Brandon. Thanks, Brandon. Cool. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you want more, make sure to check out The World Wanderers Insider, available on Patreon at patreon.com slash theworldwanderers. For show notes, head over to theworldwanderers.com. Find us on social media at the World Wanderers Podcast and join the private Facebook community at World Wanderers, a community for travelers. You can always get in touch with us at info at theworldwanderers.com. And if you enjoyed the show, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. It really helps us find new listeners. See you next time.